Hi, Mark. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Not bad. Well, that's good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Mark Bauerlein at Emory University, professor of English there. Uh, you write for First Things. Are you an editor at First Things? Uh, uh, I am. You are. A journal yes. Generally identified as conservative. I think it's safe to say. Is that right? Yeah, but really religious really conservative, uh, sort of social conservative, although we, we, we try not to be partisan uh, about uh, a lot of political matters. So we will often have some pretty sharp criticisms for uh, Republican ideology, let's say. Okay. Um, you're also the author of The Dumbest Generation, which, as I understand it, is about your students at Emory and other such institutions. It's a, it's a pretty sharp critique of, of young people and digital technology. It came out in 2008. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the real purpose of that book was to say that all the digital tools, the social media, the texting had just started developing at the time and Facebook, and that those tools were luring young people away from a lot of the activities, particularly the reading newspapers and books, that helped in their intellectual formation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not mainly what we're here to talk about. What we're mainly here to talk about is the fact that you are a rare species of academic, uh, maybe in a number of senses, but certainly in the sense that you've uh, written favorably about Donald Trump. You, you, I think, remain you remain a Trump supporter to this day. Is that right? I am. Okay. Am. Now, just to establish how rare that is, do you know of any other professors at Emory who are Trump su openly supporting Trump? None of them openly. Do you, do you know some? Is there a secret society? You have meetings and rituals? You know, there are a few conservatives at Emory and elsewhere, but the Trump issue really has cranked things up quite a bit. And as you know, a lot of conservatives have very strong reservations about Donald Trump. And a lot of them, you know, the National Review, people at the Weekly Standard, a lot of the conservative intelligentsia really were vicious in denouncing Trump. Uh, just as much as a lot of my liberal friends were. Yeah, there is real opposition uh, among people who been, often would say they are the principled conservatives and he is not. Um, I think they're right. He's, it, not, he's not the principled conservative, no. no. And, and I think what we see here is that the conservative ideology that began to be formulated really in the 1950s during the beginning years of the Cold War and the leading figures being Russell Kirk and William F. Buckley, uh, they were responding to a global situation that really hasn't obtained for a generation now. And that a lot of the conservative ideology that I very much admire in many ways simply is not applicable to our current situation and that in the cultural sphere, the conservative position has been remarkably weak at containing a lot of the progressivist outlooks and reforms that have actually triumphed extraordinarily in, in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, so to go back to the 50s, when you say there was a world situation that no longer applies, you don't just mean the Cold War, I take it. I mean, yeah, not, not really. I mean, certainly the Cold War and the Soviet Union, but also a more coherent uh, WASP American culture in which churches, for instance, were a much more powerful force. Uh, this is just before the women's movement and the sexual revolution. That's what I think is uh, uh, one of the things that the conservative movement that Buckley and others formulated really didn't have the didn't have the intellectual weapons to address as effectively as they did the arguments against collectivism and the power of the state. So they didn't face identity politics, for example. Not nearly, nearly to to the degree that we have. Now, and, and, and we can get into the issue of identity politics, because that's an important part of my support for Donald Trump, in fact. Okay. And before we do that, I mean, you brought up the, the issue of church, and uh, 
You, I gather, are a Catholic, but you were at one point uh, identified as a secular liberal. Is that right? And, and, and does secular in that case mean you were an actual atheist or what? Well, you know, when I was like a lot of late teenagers in my when I was seventeen, I had my big atheist conversion moment. I was baptized a Catholic, but my parents were were pretty lax on on bringing uh, my my brother and I and my sister up in any kind of real spiritual formation. But I, I became an atheist and uh, was uh, all caught up in Friedrich Nietzsche and uh, Jean Paul Sartre and and other figures common in the in the late seventies that one could read existentialism was still a, a meaningful thing e even at that late date uh, and I spent oh, some thirty five years as a very militant secular liberal atheist I mean I thought religious people were stupid or weak or weak. Uh, that they just didn't have the courage to face the facts of their own potential extinction after uh, their lives ended. They wanted to believe in some big daddy or mommy in the sky who would take care of them against the forces of evil and, and power, and uh, that they were simply going to be eradicated through the course of history and the progress of science and enlightenment. That was my attitude. Uh, that, that changed, oh, I mean, that started to change about 10 years ago. It's been a long process, but I, I did formally be uh, uh, confirmed into the Catholic Church just a few months ago, in fact. Oh, really? Okay. I did. I, did. I mean, the, the Catholic Church works at a glacial pace. I had some issues to, to take care of uh, in, in my past, uh, but I think that that's one of the strengths of the Church, to have some pretty strict rules about human being and conduct and that it moves very slowly in bringing people in. And, and did you yourself not have any particularly uh, sharp re moment of reconversion, you know, pretty clearly identifiable moment? Was, it, was that also I, gradual? You know, I, I think that it is extremely rare if at all possible, for one to have two conversions in a lifetime. <laughs> that's, uh, that's well I, I, I actually had my, my atheist moment really was a, a lightning flash, uh, the same kind of thing that Paul describes on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. And it hit me, you know, the, 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 the reality of nothingness hit me like a, 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 a powerful insight. You know, it took, took, took an hour, took, took me years to absorb it, but it was, it was, it was, it was just like that. Uh, my turn back toward the church and for faith is a much different process, and it's been very slow. And I do still have little voices inside me telling me that this is all an illusion and that uh, it's all fake. And sometimes when I'm sitting in the pew, the fantastical nature of it all Come, comes over me, but I don't trust those voices anymore. I think that they're wrong. So, Okay. Now, do you think, uh, as long as we're talking about religion, do you think Donald Trump is genuinely religious? I mean, he certainly, as politicians who say they're religious go, he's pretty unconventional. He says, I don't ask God for forgiveness. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that Donald Trump is, is terribly motivated by faith. I don't know how consistent his church going is. And that actually isn't what would lead me to support him or to reject him. On the religious issue, in the last few years, religious liberty has become very important to me for obvious reasons. And we have right now a very powerful clash between the First Amendment and the, and the 14th Amendment between citizenship rights, anti-discrimination, and uh, religious conscience, uh, freedom of, of religion. And that's a legal battle that is going on right now, and I respect both sides of that legal battle, but from what I can see, the power of the federal government has fallen far too much on the anti-discrimination side and that there has been a heavy hammer thrown against people of religious conscience that could be worked out in better, less confrontational ways. 
what Donald Trump's presidency means is not the salvation of religious liberty in America. That's not, that's not how I look at it. What I do see is that the weight of the federal government will be lifted for four years from, uh, from religious institutions. And I think that Hillary Clinton's presidency meant that my church would have had to hire many, many more lawyers. So I take it you're, take, you're talking about things like uh, your federal government compelling states to take a, you know, to, uh, well, the, the thing that Trump just, I guess, repealed or whatever the appropriate term is on transgender bathrooms. That, is that an example? The, the other one comes to mind is, is you know, pe- bakers being forced to bake a cake for a gay wedding if it runs against their right. religious conscience. Are these the kinds of things you're talking about? They are. Okay. They are. And, and my, my feeling is if, 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 uh, if a gay couple goes to a baker and wants the baker to do the cake and put two men on top of that cake and that baker is a lifelong Catholic or... Orthodox Jewish or, or, or Muslim whose religion says that this is not part of part of something we want to subscribe to and the Catholic Church regards marriage as a sacrament. If there's another bakery easily obtainable, then we find a way to try to accommodate both sides. If there's no bakery available for that couple tough, you have to do it for them. And and my my, my take is a little less hardening of principle and a little more flexibility, a little more accommodation for for all sides. We don't want anyone to engage in any nastiness against that gay couple. Uh, the cases that I've seen uh, involve, for example, the florist in the state of Washington, uh, whose case is now in the Supreme Court, who just lost in the Washington State Supreme Court. Now, in the State Supreme Court, she had been friends with this gay couple and providing flowers for them for 10 years. And she, first name basis, and she said, I I think the complainant's name was Rob. She says, Rob, I I can't do this for you. And there are other florists around. She responded to them with sensitivity and, and conciliation but boy, did they ever go after her in the state of Washington and the ACLU went after her. She's, a, she's a, an elderly woman who's had this, this store for years. And uh, for me, any objective person would look at this who just says, now come on, there's a way to get around this for both sides without either one feeling, uh, feeling hurt. Mm-hmm. So that, 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 that's... And, and, and this, when the state, be it the state level or the federal level, comes in with, you know, on that, on that sole, uh, sole business, it, it just makes it hard for people to work things out. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. I don't remember Trump saying a lot about these kinds of issues specifically during the campaign. Uh, I mean, clearly he has now come to be, to embrace the religious right, basically, as part of his agenda. But, but I don't remember him saying a lot about those things. In fact, for a while I was wondering whether he was going to try to wed a kind of uh, libertarianism, almost, on social issues with some... Uh, uh, but Now, he did start say early on, you're going to be able to say Merry Christmas. And it seems to me, you know, when, I, when I'm president, you know, I mean, we're not actually, you know, prohibited from it before, but anyway... Uh, uh, the, the the I mean what what I'm getting is is this kind of a general thing with him is, is that he conveyed he he sent very broad signals right he didn't talk yes. about a lot of policy generally no and and I think I think you're right in in your saying that this issue isn't really very important to Donald Trump uh, what what the, the way I looked at it as he is. Uh, disengaged from the activists who are trying to enlist the state again in a heavy-handed use of power. I actually think that, that, that Trump, he, he said about the North Carolina transgender bathroom issue, I, I don't want to interfere with that. You know, I, 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 think, I think that actually his, his daughter is very sympathetic to the LGBT uh, advocacy. I, I think that this change that we saw last week may be more to the attorney general than to 
to Donald Trump, to Jeff Sessions. I don't think that Donald Trump is certainly a, a strong religious conservative on these grounds. I think it has more to do with Trump saying, hey, let the state, let local communities, let local school districts work out whether schools are going to have a bathroom for the transgender kid mm -hmm. or not. Uh, part, part of this is getting the power, getting the decision making out of Washington, D.C. and out of the courts as well. I think a lot of frustration that motivated people uh, in the Trump campaign was the judges. The issues of feeling like judges are making law. Instead of things passing through the slow and messy legislative process, that we've got too often judges stepping in. And if, uh, if a vote against same-sex marriage went 60%, 40% in a state, and a judge overrules that, people are just thinking, naturally, wait, one person is reversing the vote of this whole state? This isn't fair. Now, apart from the legalities of it, I mean, just think about their feeling of disempowerment. And Donald Trump tapped into that very much. And this might get into an issue we want to discuss. About his first town hall meetings, his first campaign speeches, when you'd have all the, the crowds in there and it was kind of raucous, and the journalist would say, he just rambles. This went on, you know, an hour and 20 minutes, <laughs> kind, of, kind of a stream of consciousness. Uh, I actually didn't see it that way. I saw this as an unscripted, you know, unchoreographed, loose town hall meeting. And there were times when Donald Trump would invite someone up on stage. Sure, is a veteran, old guy with a, you know, a, a WW2 cap up on stage and he'd sort of turn over the microphone to that person. And this was very important in that it broke down a wall. When Hillary Clinton was up on stage or when Jeb Bush was up on stage, the people in the audience felt so different from here to there. Mm -hmm. You know, that th there, there was, again, a separation, a metaphysical separation between the candidate and the people in the crowd. Donald Trump closed that space. That's what, that, that's what very skillful demagogues do. They create a form of intimacy between leader and led, and this gets into the whole idea of the elite, you know, the perception of the political class, that they are a distinct class. They, are, they live in qualitatively different worlds. It's not just that they have more money or that they have more power. Everything about their world is different. And when I'm in the room with that person, that person just looks right through me and doesn't see me. That was what people felt. And that's what gets back to the judge's uh, issue. Just the disempowerment and the, that's where the condescension and everything else comes in that Donald Trump seemed to overcome. Right. I think certainly one thing Trump's critics didn't pick up on early on is that sometimes when he would say things that seemed outrageous and he would get a favorable response from his constituency, at least, um, and people would say, wait, they're in favor of what he said. I think half the time it wasn't so much that they were the substance of what he said. It was just that the fact that no other politician would say it m m signaled to them that he was sincere in a way that other politicians weren't. Other politicians just don't say outrageous things, and that's part of the manufacturedness of them right. and their presentation that people see, right? But Bob, they're willing to forgive a, an idiotic statement because we all make idiotic statements when we're on. We all say things when we're out in the bar, we're having a drink, we're with a group of people. We all say things that we regret. And we live in a society now where everyone has to be so careful. Everyone has to, don't say anything that might be construed as any racist thing or sexist. or we, the, the, That's where the political correctness issue comes in. We all are mistake-prone creatures. I believe in original sin. And I think that we're all going to do things wrong. If you and I are, are spending a week together, I'm going to say some things and you're going to go, oh boy, what a jerk. And, and, and it'll be, it's, just, it's just being human. And 
I think that the more Hillary appeared so handled, everything that came out of her mouth appeared, and I actually admire Hillary Clinton in, in, in many ways, but when it seemed everything coming out of her mouth has been so stroked, has been so calculated, it allowed Donald Trump to blurt out, you know, silly things that made it easy for people just to get past it and, and to say, okay, what, what, what's, what, what's he really about here? Okay, you know, Mexican rapists remark, I mean, everyone knows that that was, you know, ridiculously overdone. But they could get to a kernel of truth there and say, look, the globalists uh, are, you know, the borderless advocates, they're just denying that there may be a problem with people coming in and it producing social and civic and criminal problems. And you got to stop lying to us about that. So Trump makes his exaggerations. Well, they say, on the other hand, those guys over there, they're feeding us a line. And we know it. And if, if we were doing well, if things were going nice in our small town, we'll let them get away with it. But it's not working for us. So the, uh, it, it, it lets them bypass the, uh, the rhetoric of okay. President Trump. So you're tying several things up there. You're, I am, you're, I am. But, but I mean, they may be, I think you're suggesting that they are tied together. I don't, I don't mean that you're, you're confusing the picture. I mean, I think the, the uh, you're saying there are economic grievances, maybe not formal, but uh, economic and maybe cultural, but a sense that things aren't going as well for these people as they could for some Trump supporters. Uh, there is <clears throat> um, a, well, uh, you're connecting the issue of immigration kind of with the issue of political correctness. Uh, and I think you would also probably connect it with, connect the issue of political correctness with the issue of identity politics. And, and both the immigration and the identity politics thing have a connection to the grievance because you can say, well, an immigrant's going to take the job that my son might get otherwise. And you can also say, my son uh, might have gotten into this college, but but for affirmative action. So that that connects it to identity politics. Right. I mean, so is this a is this a fair summary of the picture from your point of view? And when people have that fear, let's say that that fear is overstated. Let's say that that fear doesn't have a lot of empirical support. You don't turn around and tell these people you're an idiot. And you are you're you're a jingoist and you're a xenophobe. You don't denounce them for having that fear. That's not good leadership. Uh, if people have some of the wrong ideas, you leave them out of those wrong ideas. I mean, LBJ was very good. If you look at how he maneuvered the Civil Rights Act through the nation. He took the case to the nation. He said things like, uh, he didn't say, we got to get around these white bigots down south. That's not how he put it. He, he would say things like, no young man ought to see his father insulted. That's, that's the way you do this. You don't demonize a population because they don't have the right ideas. And uh, the, if, the, if the fears and the resentments are overdone and that Donald Trump played upon them, uh, you know, he made people feel good. I don't think he made f people feel good about racism. I don't think that was... I think well, he that did demonize people, categories of people they resented, right? He demonizes the media. He demonizes politicians. He demonizes Wall Street. He demonizes immigrants. He demonizes Muslims. I mean, you can't deny that, right? Well, he, he would... I, I, I think the first thing, certainly he demonizes the media. And people loved that. And, and here's why. Uh, Donald Trump, I wrote about this in, in, that, in that Vox article. He started at his town hall uh, meetings uh, with this ritual of pointing to the back of the room and saying, everyone, look at them. Look at them all back there. Turn the camera. Look at them. And all the people in the crowd would turn around and look at the media. They're on their little platform. They've got their computers or their phones or their cameras. And 
it was a brilliant moment of populist power because he turned the camera around. And how many people over how many years would watch TV and see the commentators on, especially after cable TV has, has come along, and they would hear people say things and it would just infuriate them. And they can't do anything about it except turn the channel. They can't talk back. They can't say anything. They can't get rid of that person. That's that disempowerment. Donald Trump gave them that, that power. Now, for, for, that's on, on, on the media issue. Uh, on, on the politicians, same thing. And he did it in the inauguration speech. I mean, it was extraordinary at that inauguration. No conciliation, right? No, no ideas of, of, let's, you know, mend fences. He denounced everyone sitting behind him, Republican and Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> he said, these guys have had their day, and they have screwed the rest of America, and it's not going to happen any, anymore. And again, people, his supporters, loved that. Now, about the issues of, of Muslims and immigrants, immigrants as, as well. Yeah, the exaggerations. There, there, there we go. And I, I think that we have to say, we hope that when it comes time for policies to be crafted, that we will not, we will see the distinctions being made that will avoid the stereotyping, will avoid the discrimination. Now, the first rollout of that executive order on immigration, obviously that, that, that needs fixing. And you just hope that they, they learn from that and that we do get a, a, a correction. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say that I, I have faith Trump will do that because he doesn't want to lose. Well, he does, he, right. At the same time, I mean, it seems to me uh, the green card, the, 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 including green card holders and the initial immigration ban, that, that was not an accident. I think Steve Bannon very much wanted to do that, and I guess he sold Trump on it. That was not some kind of, you know, clerical error. Uh, and it, similarly, in the, uh, the executive, I guess it was an executive order about who, uh, what immigrants can be rounded up, uh, the decision was made to basically, as I understand it, say any of them. If they've committed a crime, and the crime includes things like being an illegal immigrant, right? Uh, now, now, let me just... Yeah. If, I, if he wanted... If, let, me, let me finish. If he wanted to, tr to think humanely about 11 million people who came here under a variety of conditions, some of them kids dragged by their parents, some of them dragged by their spouses, and, and many of them they came of their own volition, but at a time when the understanding was, yeah, technically it's illegal, but you can come here, you can line up in front of Home Depot. It's understood that this... So anyway, you've got 11 million people here. seems to me you could, you could tighten up on immigration in a humane way by being clear. You could expand the categories who are susceptible to arrest well beyond Obama's, what Obama had defined, but if you're clear about it, if you draw a line somewhere and are clear about it, you at least won't have 11 million people uh, who have been doing work here and been, have been productive citizens suddenly living in fear. It sure. seems to me that, that uh, you know, and Bannon's smart enough to know this. I, I, I'm not sure how smart Trump is, but, but it seems to me there's a decision being made to instill fear on a, on a large scale. And as long as I'm doing let, let me keep going. I mean, uh, there have been mosques have uh, uh, you know there have been fires in mosque. One mosque in Texas burned down entirely uh, just within the last couple of days. There was a fire in a mosque somewhere else uh, that was deemed arson. Trump says nothing. There was an Indian immigrant several days ago shot by someone who said you know who basically said I'm killing you because you're a foreign uh, extraction. And it's not at all crazy to think that Trump's victory has given some uh, momentum to these kinds of you know crazies and. It's totally within Trump's power to stand up and say something if he doesn't like it. Now, it may be, today there was a pre press briefing. I assume that Sean Spicer was asked about the, the uh, Indian victim. Maybe he finally said something. But 
I, I just I think you put it all together, and it's hard to escape the conclusion that uh, there there is an intention to instill fear in in illegal immigrants who are here, in people who might want to travel here as legal immigrants, even even in legal immigrants. I mean, if you look at at Bannon's views on this thing, I don't think it's outlandish that fear is part of the program. So if, if we shift now from your analysis of what why Trump appeals to other people to the question of why he appeals to you, my question is, does any of this, does this not bother you in a substantial way? Well, look, look every, every administration is going to have things that, are, that, 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 that you, you, you don't go along with. I mean, I, I concede what you say. About about the immigration issue and the the policy, I haven't followed the details. Uh, my own take on this is that if you've got an illegal immigrant who's hardworking and law abiding, you know that that's a productive person to to be in America. Uh, I would put the Trump. Uh, the Trump fear factor in in two contexts. One, that he's trying to break a an ideological grip uh, that has been imposed by both sides for a few decades now, and that is the globalization. He is against globalization when it seems to threaten American identity. And when you get down to that level of deeper meanings, deeper feeling of home, let's say, and that's how I understand the wall. When you talked about building a wall, what that meant for a lot of people was, hey, someone's going to respect that this is America and this is our home and we're sick and tired of feeling like the powers that be are more worried about non-Americans than they are about Americans. Now, I think with, when, when you've got such a profound change, yeah, there's going to be fear. And policies oh, no, but couldn't, have been, to... couldn't it have been done in a way that didn't instill the fear in ex in ex exactly along the lines I've just described and doesn't, doesn't that bother you? I'm... I, I imagine I imagine it could have, and and again I, I have faith that the criticism has had its has done its work, that they're going to make adjustments to handle things such as people in this country who are who want to live by the law, who don't want to cause trouble, who want a better life for themselves, and whose employers want to keep them. Because, I mean, look, look, there's some areas where if you swept out all the illegal immigrants, like, you know, here on the island of Manhattan, there would be a big, I mean, the whole place would collapse. So, look, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I remember Steve Bannon and many on Trump's team have never been in this position before. I mean, they have stepped into the most powerful organization on earth. And it's going to be a learning experience. It, it is, it, it's the first time where every word they said is going to be recorded and analyzed. And you, 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 it's not a wide open campaign anymore. You're in. And the act of governing is quite different from the act of campaigning. So it doesn't surprise me that we're going to see, you know, rollouts and uh, uh, mistakes made it's going to happen. Right, but but again, I, I just hope they get corrected. But I'm seeing very little change in response to uh, public criticism, or even uh, you know, even when the even when the the opposition is is clearly majority opposition. The the one change I've, I'm aware of is uh, you know they're going to try to redo the travel ban order because the judges are saying we're not going to let it go as passed. So so yeah, under those circumstances, though. Change, but I see Bannon as someone who who is convincing Trump that look, the more blowback we get, the more that means you're doing your job. I think, I mean, this is just my theory. I think Bannon is convincing Trump that he has a way for Trump to be considered a great historical figure. And by the way, you consider Trump a, a great. What is the term? The Hegelian term 
of historical figure. A world historical figure. World historical figure, right? And you and you have been, Don't you think that the Republican governors and senators and congressmen and donors are going to be putting pressure on the administration? You, you, you can't work this way. You have to make adjustments. We'll see. I, I think the leverage Trump has as a political matter is that I think the people in Congress are afraid of antagonizing his base. Right now, it looks like, although his public his approval rating has dipped a little before four, below 40%, it's back up now, and it seems to be kind of at a certain baseline level pretty solid. It's like, and, and I think, and I think they fear if he can get. 20, 30 percent of the people who voted for him in any given congressional district or state to turn on their uh, to turn against their legislature. That legislator is in trouble. So I don't know how much uh, they will be able to apply. He is he is as far as media criticism. He is uh, trying to uh, you know he's not exactly courting the media. He called them an enemy of the people. And this is another thing. Does this not does this not disturb you a little? To, for him to define, given the historical resonance of a phrase like enemy of the people, which I'm sure I don't have to, you know, explain to you, you're, you're clearly very conversant in the history of things like uh, authoritarianism and totalitarianism, um, and, and uh, it, does, it, does it not bother you that, that he's, he's talking that way? Hey, you know, look, when, when, he, when he talked about, tweeted about the fake news and ABC and NBC and CBS, to me it sounded exactly like Noam Chomsky, right? Noam Chomsky's been saying that the media is well, a I assume, I assume you have your criticisms of Noam Chomsky. <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. Uh, but look, how much of this uh, is working for him because <clears throat> the media so clearly take the bait and reinforce what he charges them with. I mean, if, if, if we had a, uh, if we had a media that appeared more knowledgeable and less partisan, or more, th- not even less partisan, more thoughtful than it, he, he, it, would, it would hurt him to talk this way. I mean, Charles Blow's op-eds in the wake of the election and his interviews, they're the columnist for the New York Times, and his interviews, I thought, he's unhinged. I mean, he, he, he's saying, I don't care what all those Trump supporters think. I don't care what... I'm going to say, wait a minute, you're... you're, you're you're in the you're in the press. You're an opinion columnist, right? I was going to say, but you are you're, you're sounding here just uh, as if you're living up to Donald Trump's characterization. And if if we had uh, again different figure, and I would I would go across the board. I mean, Brett Stevens on on the right. Yeah. I think he lost it a little bit as well. What did he say? Well, when he, he began... He's a Wall Street oh, Journal uh, columnist, right? Right. He, he wrote a column early, early in the... No, about midway through the primary campaign, and the first line was, if at this point you do not find Donald Trump appalling, mm-hmm. you're appalling. It's word for word. This is not going to win friends and influence people. Uh, now, when, when you've got um, people like uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other uh, columnists who took the, the route of denouncing 63 million Americans, then you want someone like Donald Trump to throw some roundhouse, to throw some haymakers. They're going to be wild sometimes, but the frustration that you have, and, and I, would, I would apply this also to, uh, to, to some of the things that happened in the Obama administration as well. I mean, I mean Bob, if we get down to a lower level than, than politics, I'm, I'm, I'm conceding your points about, about the, 
the immigration policies and the rollout. But uh, do you remember after the Obergefell decision on same-sex marriage, in which the the uh, Justice Kennedy wrote and really attributed any objections to that decision as simply due to homophobia. He actually had, it was a gratuitous thing for him to say. He didn't have to go into the motives for people objecting to same-sex marriage, but he, but he did it. That stung a lot of people. What did the Obama administration do that night? They illuminated the White House in rainbow colors. In other words, they, 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 they made the edifice of the White House into a billboard for a progressive cause. Now, why, Bob, why did they do that? Well, what that's doing is taking, you won. Yeah. You won. Now, a lot of people who are upset with that, you're just taking their faces and jamming them down into the dirt. This, this, this seems to be, again, a, a, a kind of uh, a deeply uh, demeaning action for people. I mean, you didn't have to spike the football like that. You didn't have to taunt us when you went into the end zone. You won the game here. Well, and, there may have been a kind of political logic there in terms of his consolidating his base or whatever, but I take your point that if he's true to his initially stated mission of, of unifying the country, you know, which we ran on in, 2000, uh, in 2008, um, yeah, you probably, you probably wouldn't do that. I, I mean, and, and if he really understood uh, the nature of the, you know, if he understood the array of opinion out there and the sensitivities, uh, I, I think that's quite plausible that that uh, ha had a, a polarizing effect. Um, so I, 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 I take that point, but, but, but the thing is, my, you know, my, my issues with Trump are that, for some of the reasons I've cited, polarization is his mission in life. I mean, it really is. And not only that, but, but, the, but, but, but he's trying to reinforce divisions along what are historically the most dangerous lines, right? Race, ethnicity, uh, na nation, national, nationality in some cases. These are the lines across which mass violence happens. And so I, I guess I, I'm certainly not here to defend everything Obama's done, believe me. Um, and I th and, and and don't even get me started on Hillary's uh, deplore basket of deplorables remark. One of the stupidest things ever said, and and for reasons you've already you know articulated. Bill never would have said such a thing. No, well, Bill was clearly a, a more adept politician. Yeah, I, I think he's he a very impressive he person. That way either. What's that? I don't think he ever felt that way either. Well, he came from genuinely more humble origins than she did. I think he had a natural cultural affinity with a broader, you know, swath of Americans probably than she does. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you take my point is that oh, you know, I, I I can see that we should not be in favor of polarizing things. But if that's your view, how can you support Donald Trump? Polarization is his mission in life. Okay. Uh, what I've seen. Over, over 30, 40 years. If you're a religious conservative, and I wasn't a religious conservative during most of that time, what you've seen is a religious and social conservative steadily you have lost. I mean, back in the late 70s, when the moral majority was a force, became a political force under Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, Reagan's election, they, they thought this is a reinstitution. This is going to cancel the sexual revolution and the cultural revolution. We're going we're to cancel Roe v. Wade. And they, they had the motto, take America back. Now, social religious conservatives, we have no illusions. And I'm one now. <laughs> uh, part, mainly because I, 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 I had a child that changed me. But... Uh, we have no illusions. We're so marginal at this point. Nobody, we feel nobody likes us. Corporate America doesn't like us. The, the media paints us in movies 
and and in TV shows as figures of absurdity or clowns or repressive Puritans uh, or sexists. And, and uh, uh, we were so demoralized in, in, in my world. Uh, people feel so down. And they look back. We talked about the 1950s when you could pray in school. Can't do that anymore. But surely, you, I mean, you can see why, right? Like a public school, which has, you know, I remember a teacher, by that point, the Supreme Court ruling had, had come down. So this particular public school teacher was violating the law, I think. But we recited the Lord's Prayer every morning. And I later realized there were Jewish kids in that class. I didn't. I, I was in fifth grade. It, it didn't even occur to me I, uh, at the time. But it, it, I, I later realized there definitely were Jewish kids. Now, now you you know, you yeah. can't be in favor of that, right? In the public schools. I think that prayer should be allowed in schools. I don't think it should be compulsory, and I think there should be spaces for all religious. Yeah, but asking uh, asking like a imagine a, a seven year old who's the new kid in school. And you're asking the kid to raise their hand and say, I have to be excused from the prayer? I mean, that's inflicting a lot of trauma on a kid, right? Uh, f f fair enough. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I'm, I'm thinking more things like, you know, in, 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 I'm just thinking more of the high school level um, uh, about this. I mean, we don't want proselytizing. We don't want indoctrination. Certainly. I, I agree with you. But, uh, and I have no, uh, for, for me, it's not about making a Christian. Uh, I, I believe that the more, um, the more a society disengages itself from religious belief, and I'm wide spread religious belief, the more it is going to deteriorate. That's just, that's just my, my, my assumption. That's what I see. Uh, but to get, to get back to being a religious conservative, uh, you feel you live in a hostile culture. Soft. It's soft hostility. It's especially, not, it's especially not, in academia, soft. but yeah. yeah, yeah and, and that's, that's right, in, in, in my world. And the polarization we have felt for a long time. And we feel like many Republican leaders during campaigns would give us the lip service. And then when it came down to standing firm on principle, even if you're gonna lose, they they would they would cave. I mean corporate America does not the big Republican owners do not like religious and social conservatism. It gets in the way of flow of capital, right? So uh, uh, we're willing to accept the downsides of a strong, feisty, populist candidate uh, as a realistic choice. Certainly a better choice than Secretary Clinton. And, and that's what we have to keep in mind. What was the alternative? I actually found Bernie Sanders' campaign very refreshing. I think he might have won. I think Joe Biden definitely would have won, but that's another, that's another story. No, I mean, well, look, what, 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 what they did to Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party was extraordinary. And, and the only reason... The Republicans tried to do it to Trump. They just failed. He, you know, he, he, he didn't have... Uh, uh, he didn't have all the superdelegates already lined up against him. Right. But, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, again, the unscripted nature. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's authentic. He came across as authentic. And he stood for something. Yeah, and, well, he stood for some of the issues Trump stands for, and moreover, not all of them. But uh, let me ask you this. So, um, in light of, you've already suggested that the, the media is misplaying its hand. And I, I, I agree with you that... And I don't think it's just the opinion pages. The opinion pages are the opinion pages. But I think, in some cases, the straight news coverage has become more obviously partisan in a way that I think does play into Trump's hands to some extent. Uh, now, let me ask you more broadly, if you were giving advice to Trump's opponents, I mean, you know, the people who are 
uh, organizing demonstrations, organizing, uh, you know, uh, mobilizations at town, town hall meetings that legislators have when they go back home. Anybody on the other side, what, what do you see that they're doing wrong because they just kind of don't understand the source of Trump support? Well, one thing I would say, the one thing I would say to them is do your blessed homework. I'm a teacher, so do your homework. I don't mind partisanship as long as you've done the work to make the arguments, to compile the evidence. Get out there. Go out in, in some small towns and, and wander around and don't cherry pick. Don't, don't, don't just look for a story and you know, swoop in and, and talk to a few people and then come out and act as if you've got a story. Compile your, your, your material and build up the case against Donald Trump and stop using cliches, indignation, outrage, selective representation of, of anti-Trump people. Get the celebrity, get away from the celebrities. These are not helping you do media coverage. Uh, and, and get away from your screen, get away from DC and New York, and and uh, get out in the world because then if you come off as partisan, you will be someone who's got credibility still. I, I don't think it's the partisanship that is the problem. I think it is the it is the condescension, it is the narrowness of perspective, it is the unfamiliarity with so much of the bigger realities in in this country and I see this in academia is there any more parochial figure than the brilliant college professor who's never worked in his life except on a college campus I mean I'm lucky I've worked off campuses a lot uh, for I worked in, in Washington DC in the federal government for a few years for instance uh, so I got I, I'm lucky I got a little wider perspective on, on a lot of these things but I have colleagues who think they know everything about reality in the world. Not only have they never been anywhere except a college campus, they've never attended a high school or a college or graduate school or worked in a school that wasn't a rich private school. So they're, they're formations. So I, this is what I would say to the media and also the leaders of the parties. Get out there and open your perspective. And, you, and, and it takes time. You, 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 you've got to make a genuine effort. Go back and read John Stuart Mill on liberty, his great book. He's the grandfather of modern liberalism on liberty. And read what he says about engaging with the other side and how to do it right. Well, what 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 are some of those principles? I mean, what would uh, what principles should opponents of Trump be deploying that they're not deploying? Um, in, 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 particularly in light of what they would learn if they went out and and I guess in your view discovered some things about Trump support that they don't understand now. Okay, go out into. America in pockets of Trump country and look at these, spend some time with these people until they appear to you as three dimensional human beings instead of as cardboard cutouts. I, I mean, I remember when the Tea Party came along and reading some stories by these reporters about these Tea Party gatherings. And you would think that this was an anthropologist writing about some primitive tribe in the upper Amazon River, writing back. To, I mean, they were just the, the, the distance and the caricature, uh, the, the self-congratulation on the part of those reporters in their descriptions. And in other words, I, I'm, I, I look upon these people with bemusement. And I'm so superior to them. Look, this gets down to another fundamental principle of human beings. They want recognition. They want to be recognized in their full reality. That's why condescension hurts. When someone condescends to you, it stings deep down. 
And the people in America who voted for, for Trump feel that condescension quite, quite sharply. So, so, so get out, do your homework, you know, get away from your regular social professional circuit. Be exposed. I mean, again, this was one of the, you, you, you brought this up about Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton never made anyone feel, I'm better than you are. That, that, that wasn't his character. And that was part of the that was part of the magic of Bill Clinton's political political power. And everyone knew it. He had the touch. So uh, and that was part of his back because of his background. Part of his background. Too many people now in the media and in these, you know, high levels of, of the government, they are from, you know, the top zip codes. We know the whole Charles Murray theorist uh, thesis. The top zip codes, the top schools, the top jobs, you know, at New York, Washington, they're, they're, they're in all those places. And those places are parochial zones. That's what they don't realize. They are parochial. They, they, they don't give you a broad perspective, however brilliant those people are. Okay, so it sounds like you're suggesting, first of all, everybody on the anti-Trump bandwagon, whether it's journalists, protesters, politicians... Would just benefit from understanding Trump supporters better, just for purposes of informing their tactics and strategy. But but it sounds like also you're suggesting that maybe, if for example reporters did homework and then depicted them, I mean, say there were in the New York Times, and I, I will say there's been some of this, a, a kind of. A, I, I, a, I have a, seen. I mean, I, I think like I at the Washington seen. Post, I think Dave Weigel, for example, has always been good about uh, because he comes from a somewhat conservative background. He's always been good about doing the anthropology in a pretty non-judgmental way. But are, are, are you suggesting that maybe if if Trump supporters out in the heartland <clears throat> saw? you know, at least neutral or possibly sympathetic depictions of themselves in the New York Times, on CNN, it would actually make it harder for Trump to demonize... Uh, in other words, th- these media outlets would be serving their own interests if they did that. Absolutely, Bob. And it doesn't mean that they wouldn't end up coming down on those Trump supporters. But we would get a three-dimensional portrayal that would always give us some mixture of motives and attitudes and experiences in them. Again, it's it's all the difference between a uh, uh, you know a drive-by glimpse of people that just reinforces the usual stereotypes, or are you going to present a human a human being? And even if the vices outnumber the virtues, which is often going to be the case, we, we get a full person. That's what I would say. Now, there was a story in the New York Times after the election that talked about the forms of therapy that people are undergoing in order to cope with the election. And, and you know, it, it was clearly the reporter was sympathetic with these people who were distressed by the outcome. But there was also a bit of wit and irony to it as well. That, that, that's what gave that story some, some depth. And I, I actually wrote to a Times editor saying, that's a good reporter. You should have more of that. Do you so, remember who the reporter was? I, I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember the name. Uh, so, all right, well, we've come to the end of the hour. That's good advice. Um, and, and thank you. Mark, for taking the time. Maybe we'll check in with you down the road as the uh, see uh, check in on how the resistance is, whether the resistance is taking your 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 guidance to heart, which I, I know at one level you'd rather they didn't, uh, probably because you you probably don't at this point want them to succeed. But um, again, you, people can read your stuff at first things where you are an editor at least sometimes, and they and I guess you'd say they should read it in any event, uh, whether whether your stuff is in it or not. You're the author of The Dumbest Generation. If people are curious as to how exactly the digital world has degraded their cognitive capabilities, uh, or however you might put it. Um, that's good. That's good. Okay. That's, that's a real... You think that's a good commercial pitch? You, you, I, thank, you, I, thank you. I authorize you to use it. It's not copyrighted. Um, gotcha. and, uh, and you're a professor of English at uh, Emory University. So thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.